Leave it to Beaver. Okay, I know I'm probably showing my age in this group, all right? But how many of you all remember watching that classic family show either in reruns or in syndication, or first, first time or in syndication? Okay, I won't, tell you, I won't ask you which one. Okay, I'm not going to do that. All right? So, what better way could there be to start a sermon on family than with a clip like that? You know, because many times when we think of the perfect family, we think of families like the Cleavers. Okay, and I know we have our own Cleavers here. Okay, and so if you want to think about them, you can talk to them, get the secrets after church if you want. But for the purposes of this sermon, I'm going to talk about June and Ward and Wally and Theodore. Right? Okay. And by the way, Beaver's name was Theodore. It wasn't Beaver. Okay, that was his nickname, all right? But the Cleaver family was designed by the writers to be the ideal, perfect 1950s American family, right? A model for all who owned a television set for what family ought to look like. Now, sure, there were troubles along the way for the, for the Cleaver family. Otherwise, it wouldn't be much of a show. But every episode seemed to have an element of redemption to it. You know, I remember as a kid watching Leave it to Beaver every day after school. I watched them in reruns on a syndication as I was not yet born when it first aired in 1957. But I can honestly say that I have seen all six seasons for a total of 235 episodes, including the pilot, which was called It's a Small World, which, by the way, you might not have known that. There's a little bit of trivia for you. But I've watched all of them at, through at least three times completely. Okay? I loved it. I loved to tune in to find out what kind of jam the beaver would get into, Right? With each and every episode, there was always something. One of my favorite characters was always Eddie Haskell, right? Anybody, y'all remember Eddie Haskell? If you're too young and you don't know who Eddie Haskell is, imagine that friend that's always trying to get you in trouble, okay? That's Eddie Haskell, right? I think Eddie Haskell was probably my favorite because I had friends like that. I did. And if I'm absolutely honest with you this morning, there were times that I was Eddie Haskell for some of my friends, okay? I'll admit that to you. I will. But Eddie was, like I said, he was always trying to get Wally and the Beaver into all kinds of mischief. But I will tell you, I remember thinking that all of my problems in life could be solved in 30 minutes. I did. After all, that's how long it took for the the Beaver and Wally and Lumpy and Eddie to get into all kinds of trouble and then to eventually find a way out of it. That's because by the end of the episode, every single mess was cleaned up. The wrongs were righted. the, The tarnish on the image of the ideal, perfect American family was completely wiped away. It was wonderful to escape to a simpler time with a perfect family for about a half an hour. But eventually, eventually I had to step back into the messiness of a real family. As I pushed that little knob to turn off the television, my eyes still adjusting from the glow, from the lingering glow from the tube, I began to realize that the ideal family as portrayed by the Cleavers in glorious black and white on that little 13-inch TV with foil-covered rabbit ear antennas. You know what I'm talking about, church, okay? That was not the reality of the world that I knew. Life was messier than any mess the beaver ever got into. The families that I knew, even though, even my own, they looked so much different than they did. There was divorce, abuse, poverty, alienation, addiction, things that couldn't be fixed within a a 30-minute time span. You see, being family together is messy. And it requires more of us than we care to give at times. But if we remain committed to our families, the blessings can be endless. But there's something we need to do. The first thing that we need to do is to get past this ideal, leave it to beaver image of family, right? Because in many ways, that's the mental image that we work with when we say the good Christian family, right? That's what we think about. We think about families like the Cleavers. But here's the the problem. There's actually a reality. And the reality is that there's, there's somewhere on the spectrum is where the real family is. Somewhere on the spectrum between the Leave it to Beaver family, right? That perfect family structure. And then the show that shattered the image of the perfect American family, Married with Children. And if you've seen Married with Children, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen it, don't watch it, all right? Don't watch it. It's, it's not one that I recommend, right? So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the risky family. We're going to look at risky family, and to do so, I want to spend time talking about some biblical families that that fall somewhere on that spectrum, right? Somewhere on that spectrum. And then what we can learn from Scripture about how we can strengthen our families through a commitment to each other and a commitment to God. But before we go any farther this morning, let's pause for a moment of prayer. Let's pray. Holy God, as we gather in this time and in this space, Lord, as we hear from your word, 
as we hear you speak to our hearts today, God, I pray that the words of my mouth, Lord, that they be your words. And God, if they're, not, if they're not your words, I pray that you change them. So that each heart that is here today, Lord, may be strengthened in you. They may be strengthened to do family better. And so that we may be as your family better. Thank you, God, for all that you do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, I think that if we're going to look at the reality of family, then we need to go back as far as we can and see how this concept of family has played out since the beginning of time, right? That's probably the only place to start is at the very beginning. So we're going to spend the next three hours going through every family in the Bible. Um, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that, all right? But a great place to start is, at, is by looking at the pages of Scripture. After all, there are so many family stories shared in the pages of Scripture. Now, I will tell you just as a warning this morning, okay, just as I'm getting ready to get started, this brief journey that we're about to take into the families of the Bible is rated PG, okay? It's rated PG. I'm just going to throw that out there. I want to caution you before we get started. Kids, if you have questions, sorry, parents, okay? Ask them. But Because all of the stories that, that I'm going to share, they leave a lot to be desired, and some leave very little to the imagination. So let's start in the beginning with the very first family, Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve. If there ever was a perfect ideal family for us to model, it had to be Adam and Eve, right? It had to be. I mean, they had it all. They had a beautiful garden with endless food. They had animals like a lion or a snow leopard or my new favorite, the cutest thing ever, the red panda. Oh, they're beautiful. If you haven't seen a red panda, you've got to get one, okay? But they had them as a pet. Streams of crystal clear, unpolluted water. There was not a water bottle floating in that creek anywhere. A daily walk in the presence of God. And they had one rule. Just one rule. You know what that rule was, church, don't you? Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You got all of this. Stay away from here, right? That's all they had to do. God made Adam and Eve to be partners. Made them to complement each other. Everything started out perfect. Everything started out absolutely ideal. And then came a snake. Eve is deceived into eating the forbidden fruit, and then she offers some of that same forbidden fruit to her husband, Adam. With one bite, with one bite, they broke the one rule that they were given, and sin entered into the world, and the perfect family was cast out of the perfect garden to experience the hardships of life. Just one bite. This is where the story of humanity starts to turn a little south. See, we've not even gotten out of the third chapter of the first book of the Bible, okay? That's how far in we are. But then we turn to the fourth chapter, and things get just a little worse, when we see the sins of jealousy and murder for the very first time in the story of Cain and Abel. Within the first generation, we've already moved off script from anything that you ever would have seen on Leave at the Beaver. Well, let's continue our journey and make a stop in the life of Noah. By the time Noah comes on the scene, the world had plummeted into darkness as they have given themselves over to temptations and sins. So much so that God calls Noah to build this massive boat, and then once it's completed, God sends every kind of animal in pairs of two to occupy it with a 600-year-old Noah, his wife, their three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and his, and his son's wives. And then God floods the earth, right? They find themselves floating on this massive ark for over a year. Now, I don't care how big the ark would seem on the outside, but living on a boat with thousands of animals in there... Um, droppings, okay? That's going to get a, put a strain on any family, right? We have one dog and it puts a strain on us. I can imagine thousands of animals. And this is what we see with Noah, right? The first thing Noah does is he gets off and he plants a vineyard and then he makes some wine and he bottles it up and then he winds up getting drunk and he becomes, and he just lays naked in his tent. And Noah's son Ham sees him lying there in his uncovered state and he begins to make comments and jokes to his brothers about it. When Noah finally sobers up, he curses Ham and Ham's son Canaan. I can only imagine that might make future family reunions a little awkward, right? Once again, this is not something you would have seen from Ward, Wally, or the Beaver. Now, jump to the story of Abraham, the father of many nations, the patriarch of the Hebrew people. Remember the story with me, right? God comes to Abraham and promises him that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky, as plentiful as the grains of sand on the beach. Abraham was in God's favor, but even this righteous man struggled when it came to his family. Twice, twice he passed his wife Sarah off as his sister and gave her to the Pharaoh of Egypt and the king of Gerar just to save his own life. Twice. 
Later on, a 76-year-old Sarah, worried that she would never have children, has Abraham sleep with her servant Hagar to give him an heir. Ishmael is born, and then at the age of about 14, when his half-brother Isaac is born, he and his mother are sent away to the desert to fend for themselves, all because of Sarah's jealousy. I will tell you, I never saw any of that in an episode of Leave it to Beaver. The very next generation. I mean, we're just moving our way through the generations here. Isaac, Abraham's son, has twin boys of his own, Esau and Jacob. Esau, since he was the, the firstborn by only a few seconds, was custom, by custom, was the one who, who was to receive the blessing of his father and the birthright. Now, having these two things in Jewish society were extremely, extremely important because it gave them prominence and gave them possession. He would become the head of the household when his father Jacob passed on, leaving, or I'm sorry, Isaac passed on, leaving Jacob in second place for, to his brother for the rest of his life. But Jacob, whose name literally means trickster, Jacob tricks Esau to give up his birthright for a cup of soup, right? That must have been an amazing cup of soup. And then he partners with his mom to trick his blind father by putting on animal fur on his body so that he felt like his brother when his dad touched him to receive the blessing. Esau finds out and gets angry, right? And rightfully so. So Jacob takes off for a safer land. And that's where the trickster finds himself when he falls in love with Rachel. Rachel's the second daughter of his uncle Laban. He works, he works it out with Laban to labor for him for seven years before he can marry Rachel. And at the end of seven years, guess what? There's a wedding. But Jacob didn't marry Rachel. But instead, he married his sister Leah. Laban had made a switch and Jacob, the trickster, had been tricked. Now, I will tell you, Rachel must have been an amazing woman because Jacob works for another seven years for the right to marry her. And I'm sure that before he said, I do that time, he kind of peeked under the veil just to make sure. But now he finds himself married to two sisters who can't stand each other and enter into a battle to see who could give Jacob more kids. By the time it's done, Jacob has 12 sons. Now, you've probably heard that old saying that parents shouldn't have favorites when it comes to their kids, right? I don't have favorites when it comes to my kids. I don't. I tell my daughter all the time that she's my favorite daughter. I do. I, I tell her that. And my son's my favorite son. But this is where it all started. You see, Jacob loved one of his sons more than any of the others. And he showed it by giving Joseph a coat of many colors. This, and of course, the dream that Joseph had that one day his brothers would bow down to him, set all of his brothers against him. So they decided to sell him into slavery. They told his dad that he was eaten by wild animals. Church, I'm here to tell you, we haven't gotten out of Genesis yet. Okay? We're still in Genesis. But we are extremely far off from the ideal of the leave it the beaver family, right? We're nowhere near that. We could go on. King David, a man after God's own heart, started out well with his wife, Michael, but, but the story goes kind of R-rated when, when David sees Bathsheba bathing, and he has to have her as his own. He gets her pregnant, and in an attempt to cover it up, had her husband Uriah killed. The child from that union passed away after only seven days. By the end of David's story, David has eight wives and over 20 children. Solomon, David and Bathsheba's second son, he had a few wives, 700 to be exact, and 300 concubines, and we don't know how many kids. So the ideal of one man and one woman found in Genesis 2 is kind of out the window. Nothing like these stories ever aired on that little black and white TV that I had in my room growing up. Especially nothing that you would have seen from June Ward, Wally the Beaver, or even Eddie Haskell, right? You wouldn't have seen those. So why do I tell you this? Please understand, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to be, to be crude or flippant about these people of Scripture because their struggles were real, just as ours are. You see, we struggle just like they did to be good spouses, to be good parents, to be good grandparents, even to be good kids, right? We want to have that perfect family. And when we fail, when we don't measure up to the beaver's family, we feel defeated. We feel like there's absolutely no hope. So hear me when I tell you this this morning, church. If your family is not ideal, if your family is not ideal, then you're in pretty good company, okay? You're in pretty good company. That's because none of the stories that I share with you lived up to the ideal of God in Genesis 2, right? They all fell way, way short. They fell short of God's ideal, but yet in all of them, God used these people to do mighty things. And God blessed their lineage all the way to the life of the only one who could ever claim the title of perfection, Jesus. Right? Trace him back. 
And the truth is, church, we're no better than they are. We have failed at this thing called family. We have. And if we're honest, and I think we need to be honest, if we're honest, we realize that, that we have failed at one point or another. And being absolutely transparent with you all this morning, I admit that I'm guilty. I'm guilty of, of letting my own commitment to my own family wane. But even as I recognize this and know that I'm not the first one to fall short of the ideal, I also know that grace and mercy are available from a God who loves all of us as his family and his children. Amen, church? Here's a truth that I heard from Greg Boyd, preaching pastor at Woodland Hills Church. He says this, even though God has an ideal, he is willing to bend and meet people where they are. Think about that. Even though God has an ideal, even though God has a, a perfect message, even though God is perfect and God is absolute righteousness and absolute holiness, even though God has an ideal, he's willing to bend and meet people where they are. You see, we're no closer to perfection than they were. Yet God still calls us and uses us just as he did them. So what does this mean for our family? What does this mean for our families today? It means to me that God's grace and mercy is available for our families as much as it is for us as individuals. Now, I know that I just preached on grace and mercy not too long ago, but remember, I just want you to remember the definitions with me for just a moment. Remember, grace is getting what you do not deserve. Grace is getting what you do not deserve. Mercy, mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Let me put it in terms of family. Just because your family right now does not live up to the ideal, God does not condemn you and leave you and your family in the mess that you created. That is mercy. Instead, instead God calls you, in, God, God's love calls to you in the messiness of your family and seeks to bless the whole of the family. That is grace. That's grace. You see, God doesn't come and command us to clean up the messiness of our lives and our families, and then maybe, maybe God will bless us along the way, right? But instead, God says, let me come and bless you as you are, and I'm going to move you closer and closer and closer to the ideal. See, that is God's grace and mercy at work in our families, all because of his love for us and for our families. And let's face it, church, if God didn't do this, if God did not do this on an individual level or on a family level, we'd all be sunk. But instead, we have hope for our families because of God's grace and God's mercy. And once again, if we're honest, we know that being family is difficult. And even though most of us do not hang the, the message of our family and the clotheslines out back to dry for the world to see, the reality is that all of us need some help to repair or strengthen our commitments to our families. Maybe that's because there's a strained relationship with you and your children or your grandchildren. Maybe commitment to something else like, like work has come between you and your families. Maybe there's been too much pain due to a personal mistake to keep those that you love at a distance. Maybe it's the lingering hurt and pain of a divorce that keeps you from fully forgiving the one who walked away. Maybe it's addiction that, that drags you away from the time that you should be sharing with your family. Or maybe it's a, a roaming eye that draws your attention from the family that is truly important. Maybe it's just a genuine mistrust of others that keeps you from fully opening up to those who are supposed to love you the most. Whatever it is for you and your family, the reality is, is that we need help. We cannot do this on our own. If we could have done this on our own, then this world, this nation, this state, this community, this church, and even our families would look a lot different. Amen? Amen? We would be the stars of our own television show if we could have done it on our own. We could have been the stars of the show like Leave it to CB. You're probably wondering what CB stands for. CB was a nickname that my dad used to call me. It stands for Chatty Bobo. I know I'm going to regret ever telling you that. I know that. The Beaver was a nickname, so I felt like I had to share my nickname. In fact, my, ne my nephew still called me Uncle Bobo because of it. But the truth is, I don't have my own show. I don't have my own show because I need help. We need help. So to echo the words of the same King David that we just talked about, where does our help come from? Our help comes from the name, comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. 
You see, church, we need to trust we need to trust our families to the care of the one who knows us completely and loves us unconditionally. We need to embrace our families right now in whatever condition they might be in and then offer our families to God. As I said, God doesn't require that you get it all sorted out first and then come. No, just the opposite. God says, invite me into the present, invite me into the present and the messiness of your family and I'll bless you where you are and I'll move you closer and closer and closer to the ideal. To do this, we have to recommit ourselves to our family and commit our families to God. This is what we see in our scripture for today. But you think I'm never going to get to the scripture. Well, I am. Our scripture today from Matthew 6, 25 through 34. From this passage, I just want to make two points. So as we read along, just, just, just follow along. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body or what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food in the body, more than clothes? Look at the birds in the sky. They don't sow seed or harvest grain or gather crops in the barn. And your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than they are? Who among you by worrying can add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? Notice how the lily in the fields grow. They don't wear themselves out with work and they don't spin cloth. But I say to you, they're not even Solomon, the same Solomon we just talked about, in all of his splendor, wasn't dressed like one of these. If God dresses the grass in the field so beautifully, even though it is alive today and tomorrow, it's thrown into the furnace. Won't God do much more for you, you people of weak faith? Therefore, don't worry and say, what are we going to eat or what are we going to drink or what are we going to wear? Gentiles long for these things. Others say, say pagans long for these things. Your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. Instead, listen to this church. Desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, stop worrying about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see, it all comes down to verse 33, church. And this should be the focus for our families. Desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you as well. What would it look like if we had kingdom families? Families that were focused on bringing the kingdom of God and advancing the kingdom of God as their highest priority in all situations, at all times, in all relationships, to all people regarding all issues. Church, the goal for us as a family of Christ here in this place at East Cross is to manifest and further the kingdom of God. And I will tell you, it should be our main goal in our personal families as well. Jesus teaches us to seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And I'll tell you, these two things go hand in hand. God's kingdom lives wherever God rules wherever God rules. And God's righteousness is about right relatedness, right relatedness to God and to ourselves and to our spouse and to our families and to our friends and with all with whom we engage. It's putting God first in all of those relationships as we work towards the same goal that God has. That's what it means to be kingdom people and what it means to have a kingdom family. You see, parents and grandparents, it is our job to raise kids who seek first the kingdom and develop a heart of Jesus. It's our job. So how do we do this? It's a daunting task, right? How do we do this? I think there's some practical ways that we can do this by spending time in prayer with them, reading the Bible, doing devotions together. But the main way, the main way that we can, that we can raise kids who seek first the kingdom and have a heart of Jesus is by modeling it for them. You see, I've learned the hard way that there are always a pair of eyes that are watching every single move I make. They see the times that I succeed as a parent and a follower of Christ, and they see the times that I fail. They see how I structure my day and what is important based on on the time that I allocate to each task. They see the hard work that I put into some things and and the laziness that I have for others. They see how I respond to those who stress me out. No names, Evan, okay? Stress me out and cause me grief, right? But they also see how I'm willing to help others when called upon. You see, family, kids learn how to interact with the world around them by how they see others interact. And especially they learn this from their parents and their family members. Sure, we can always talk a great game, right? But if our words and our actions don't match up, our kids are the first to notice. We need to model what it means to be passionate for the kingdom. 
We need to model what it means to be passionate for the kingdom. They need to see each and every one of us sold out for God. And see, and that's true in our individual families, but it's also true here in our church family as well. You see, our kids and our youth here at East Cross, they need adults to come alongside them, to love them into a relationship with Jesus and model for them what it means to be all in for God. That's your responsibility as the church. Love on these kids. You see, if you want things to change and the world to reflect more of the truth of God's kingdom, then I, I invite you to hear the words of Gandhi. Gandhi says, you need to be the change you want to see in the world. See, the reality is that I can't change anybody else. You can't change anybody else. We can only change ourselves. So if we want our families, our immediate families, our extended families, our church families to change and be more Christ-like, then it starts with us. It starts with you. It starts with me. We need to model what it means to seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. We need to do that. But another thing we can do is we can also invite our kids into kingdom-seeking decisions. For example, I share with you that, that I've always got eyes focused on me. They take in how I respond to certain situations, and, and one way is how I respond to those who, who, as I said, who bring unneeded stress into my life. And when I get stressed, I'm one of those guys that it shows. I, I can't hide it very well. I can't. I try, but I, I, I can't. How different would the lesson be if instead of carrying that stress with me and blowing up at every little thing, if instead I would have an age-appropriate conversation, once again, age-appropriate conversation with my kids about what has happened, and spend time praying for guidance and praying for those who have wronged me with them, how different would that look? I tell you, they look a lot different when they go back to their other relationships and experience something very similar, right? You've modeled it. You've shown it. One illustration that Pastor Greg Boyd shared was about a family car that was going out. They needed to get a new one. But instead of getting one that has all the bells and whistles, they settled for one that meets their needs because their priority was not the mode of transportation. But as they sat down as a family, they discussed this, and they realized that their priority instead was the tithe that they gave to the church to help ministry happen so that lives can be changed for the kingdom. How much would that conversation impact our kids if we involve them in the kingdom-seeking decisions and help them develop more and more of a heart of Jesus? We need to look for opportunities to model the kingdom and righteousness of God for our kids. Because the truth is that it's caught more than it's taught. That's the first thing. We need to model for kids what it means to be passionate for the kingdom and to be sold out for God. The second is that we need to take time and be present with our kids. Because as I said, it takes time to catch the kingdom. Let's face it. There are so many things that are vying for our time and our attention, right? I mean, as grandparents, as, as parents, as church members, we have distractions that are pulling us off of what is truly important. In fact, Jesus spends verses 25 through 32 talking about all the distractions that we worry about, right? He talks about food. He talks about drink. He talks about clothing. And I hear that these things are important. Don't get me wrong, okay? But what he's saying is that don't let these things consume you. Instead, we need to be consumed with the kingdom. We need to be consumed with the kingdom and not spending all of our time and all of our energy chasing after the stuff the world chases after, as verse 32 says. You know, I'm talking about the next promotion. I'm talking about the, the biggest house. I'm talking about the nicest car, the latest and greatest. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things. But when they become your driving force at the expense of your relationship with God, at the expense of the relationship with your children and your family, in church, there's a problem. Those relationships begin to break down. They begin to suffer. So we need to be attentive to those relationships. And the only way to do this is to take time for and be present with God and our families. Now notice, it sounds like I kind of said that doubly, right? I said take time for, but I also added the, the be present in there. Because I'll tell you, we can be with our families and not really be there. We have to be diligent not to make this happen. You know, one way to be present with our families is to share a meal together. I look forward to the meal times that we had together. I do. There's nothing more wonderful than when a family has the opportunity to sit down and eat together. This conversation just kind of seems to happen. Yet you know, one of the most interesting things that I've witnessed over the last couple of years is families sitting at the same table at a restaurant, and yet they're so far away. They're actually miles away. 
You know why? Because they're all right here. They're on their phones. Oh, hey, today's Cubs lineup. All right. They're all on their phones. They're doing important stuff like checking the latest post from East Cross's Facebook page. They're finding out what Beyonce tweeted. They're seeing the last picture from the Chicago Cubs on Instagram. Or maybe they got that, that, that quick snap from an ex-friend that just puts them in a bad mood. They all have their faces down. They're being illuminated by the glow off of that little screen. And they're absolutely missing the blessing that's literally right in front of them. We need to put the phones and the tablets down and go old school. We need to talk with our families. We need to put the phones down and return to the joy of a family game night. Evan keeps threatening to have a family game night at my house. And we did it once. We need to do it again. It was fantastic. I don't know why Evan had to be there, but it was fantastic. <laughs> He's part of our family. It just He comes over. It's what he does. We need to put our phones down and take a walk together. We need to put our phones down and be present with our families. I'll tell you this at the end of the rant because I'm talking to myself on that. But it's not just our phones that keep us from being present with our families, is it? And it can be lots of stuff. Lots of things like work or, or TV or, or financial burdens or so much more. I tell you, I, I, I can take time from my family and I cannot be there. I can literally be in the room with my wife and my kids and be right back here at church thinking about something else I've got to get done. Too many distractions keep me from, 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 from being fully present with my family. And sometimes those distractions, they come from the, the best place, right? They come from these, these best of intentions. Like taking pictures of your kids, right? In fact, Friday night at Cameron's baseball game, I was so consumed with my camera and, and, and the settings and the framing and getting the perfect shot that I actually missed his first hit of the season. Even though I was there. Even though I, I, I got a picture of almost a point of contact. I can't tell you more than it was a single. So I looked up and he's on first base. I missed it. And to top it off, the camera focused past him, so the picture of him is really kind of blurry. Didn't even work out for him. You see, we might have had the best of intentions for our family, but if we're not truly present, those intentions don't really matter. We need to be more than just there physically for our own kids, our own grandkids, the kids in the church, and our families. We need to be pouring into their lives and showing them what the love of God looks like. Now, church, I will tell you, family can get messy. It can. It gets messy anytime we get involved in the lives of those that we love. Those messes normally to get cleaned up in 30 minutes. Because we don't have that perfect, that ideal, leave it to beaver family. It's because our families are real. Real people with real problems doing real life together. So hear me this morning. I don't want you to get down. I don't want you to say, man, I, I, I can't measure up to Ward and June and, and Wally and Theodore. Show me Eddie's family, I might be able to match that. Don't get down. But know that God in his love has offered you and your family grace and mercy. God does not command that we get it all cleaned up first, but instead has offered to come into the messiness of your family, to come into the messiness of my family and move us all closer and closer to that ideal. Don't misunderstand me. There's work to be done. There is work to be done. We have to recommit ourselves to God and to our family if we want our family to succeed. We need to be kingdom-minded as a family, modeling what, what it means to have a heart of Jesus. We need to take time for and be present with our families, truly pouring into their lives. You see, church, things will not change unless we start with ourselves. So today, commit yourself to making your family better. Commit yourself to being a kingdom person. Commit your family to being a kingdom family. Commit yourself to being a better model of Jesus to those who are always watching. Commit yourself to take time for your family. Commit yourself to truly be present with your family. You see, church, it's time to commit. It's time to be family. Let us pray.